Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, who said, let light shine out of darkness. Amen. <clears throat> did you notice the description, as uh, Pastor Bitter was reading, did you notice the, the description God gave of what the first Passover sounded like, felt like? Did you notice that? Let me read the last verse again from Exodus chapter 12. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. <clears throat> that sounds like an, an actual nightmare, doesn't it? Waking up in the middle of the night and finding your firstborn dead. First Passover was a it was a dark night, wasn't it? I still remember watching, maybe you've seen it, The Ten Commandments, the old Cecil B. DeMille movie. I still remember watching that as a little boy and, and having chills run down my spine when the, the angel of death passed through Egypt. It was a dark night. There, there was loud wailing in Egypt. There was not a house without someone dead. And God told his people to commemorate this every year. In fact, he said, when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. This was the, the meal, the Passover, that Jesus said he was eager to commemorate with his disciples, to remember how the Lord brought death and destruction into the homes of those who opposed him and rejected him as God, and also to remember how the Lord in his mercy spared the homes of the Israelites who had blood on their doors. I don't think we would say that, that a Passover meal was, was a joyful celebration. Solemn is probably a better word to describe it. And Solomon, or Solemn, is also a good way to describe the event that took place that we heard about in the Gospel according to Mark. Only it was solemn for different reasons. It says that while Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, he told them, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. Can you imagine? After Jesus dropped that bomb, I don't know how else you want to say it, but a solemn observance of a Passover turned depressing, sorrowful, as each one of the disciples wondered, is it going to be me? Is it going to be you? Who's Jesus talking about? And don't you get the sense Jesus was ambiguous on purpose? At least in the gospel according to Mark. He doesn't, he doesn't outright say which one of them is going to betray him. He just says, one of you. One who's eating with me. In other words, it could be any one of you. It could be any one of you. Jesus wanted those 12 men to realize something about themselves, something that we humans try so hard to hide and so hard to deny. And that is that we are all capable of great evil and great wickedness. Jesus wanted all of those men to realize the powerful pull of temptation. The temptation to exchange the glory of God for something that we can see and touch. Something like 30 silver coins. 
just in case any one of them was going to get the idea that, that sin isn't somehow an eternally destructive thing, Jesus then went on and said, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had never been born. It would be better for him if he had never been born. You know, sometimes we'll see people in a situation and we start to think of reasons why maybe it would have been better for them if they had never been born. Maybe we'll see someone who is born into poverty. Maybe their parents abandoned them. And they'll never have access to good health care. They'll never have access to good nutrition, a steady diet. You could even think of maybe like Lazarus and the parable of the rich man and the poor Lazarus where he's longing for scraps that fall from the rich man's table. He's got sores all over himself. And, and so we might look at people like that and think, man, it'd be better for them if they had never been born than to live a life like that. Or sometimes God in his wisdom creates a human being that has handicaps that other people just don't have. And then all of a sudden people are talking about, well, you know, what's their quality of life going to be? It's going to have a poor quality of life. Maybe it would be better if they had never been born. But when Jesus talks about reasons why it would be better for someone never to have been born, he talks about things like knowing the true God and turning your back on him. He talks about things like tasting in the forgiveness of sins. And like a dog who returns to its vomit, going back and embracing the very thing that made us sick to begin with. When Jesus talks about reasons why it would be better for someone to never have been born, he talks about walking out of the presence from the God who loves you and cares for you in exchange for something that will eat you alive. Woe to that man. It would be better for him if he had never been born. And I think that all of us would agree that it would be better for someone. It would be better, in general, never to have been born than to ever have to hear God say, away from me, I never knew you. Depart into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. What a dark night it must have been for the twelve as Jesus' words penetrated their hearts. What a dark night it is for us as we consider what Jesus said. Don't you think his words made the disciples wonder a little bit about their their commitment to him? Don't you think Jesus' words kind of made them question how faithful they actually were? Do they make you wonder? Do they make you stop and ask yourself, how faithful am I? What is my commitment to Jesus? Do they make us realize? Realize our own potential to turn away from what's good and to embrace what's evil even when we know how harmful it'll be for us. In Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul says, if, if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Friends, the only thing that's worse than actually betraying Jesus is thinking that it could never happen to us. And so the Apostle Paul says, if you think you are standing firm, 
Watch out, lest you fall. It was a dark night for the twelve. And I suppose it could be a dark night for us too as we realize how weak and how fragile we are and how prone, how prone toward that which is evil. But Jesus didn't leave his disciples. Let me say that a different way. Jesus didn't let darkness, he didn't let that overcome his last supper with his trembling disciples. Jesus won't let darkness overcome his time with us this evening. Having exposed us and having shown us the things about ourselves that we try hard to deny and hard to hide, Jesus does something interesting. Do you notice that he didn't tell his disciples, here are five steps to fight sin in your life. As a matter of fact, I want each one of you to, to do something to prove your faithfulness to me so that you won't ever betray me. Jesus did something for them. Jesus gave them hope on the darkest night. Mark tells us, <clears throat> while they were eating, Jesus took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, which is poured out for you. Instead of saying... Away from me, you evildoers, Jesus said. Come to me, you who are weary and burdened. Come. A friend calls it God's supper with sinners because that's what it is. And that's who it's for. When we want to show that everything's okay between us and other people, that everything's good and well. Maybe we have a meal together. We eat together and we, we drink together and we spend time with one another. That's what our Lord Jesus is coming to do with us tonight. Only he gives us himself. And I know it looks like regular plain bread and tastes like wine, and it is. But Jesus says, see with your ears. And yes, I said that the right way. See with your ears. This is my body, which was pierced for your transgressions, and it was crushed for your iniquities. And this is my blood, which purifies you from all unrighteousness. The very body and the very blood by which God declares the whole world forgiven, beloved, absolved. So how do we get ready for a meal like this? A meal where we're coming to be next to the Lord himself. Should we do something special? We need to to bring something Martin Luther in the small catechism talks about what it means to be properly prepared. He says fasting is a good thing. Other outward observances, those may serve a good purpose. But he is properly prepared who believes these words given and poured out for you. This is for you. We're not doing something special for God when we come to the table. He's doing something for us. He's giving us peace and the hope of life everlasting. As those men 
were gathered there on that dark night, they did receive hope from Jesus who promised that he would one day drink anew with them in the kingdom of God. And for centuries, that's what Christians have been doing. Guilty people redeemed by the blood of Christ, gathering together where Christ himself comes, gives himself to us, unites us with one another. It puts us all on the same plane. We're all capable of great sin, and we've proved it. But together we worship a God who's capable of great sin love and he's proved it so as you come to this meal and as we proclaim together that God loves guilty people that God saves guilty people as we proclaim that together we also proclaim that to the world until the day when the darkness turns into dawn And we see Jesus face to face. Amen.